Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. Today we're going to talk about the Naga, a classic monster loosely derived from the Sanskrit word for the cobra snake and the supernatural mythology of uh, mainly Hindu origin. But it's really only a superficial resemblance, um, as is typical of a lot of original Dungeons and Dragons monsters. In D&D, oh and I should mention that um, I'm drawing this research for this, um, this article, if you will, from um, old issues of Dragon Magazine, Dungeon Magazine, um, the Serpent Kingdoms um, uh, source book from 3.5 edition and of course third edition and some old depictions from very old magazines and um, supplements across the history of Dungeons and Dragons as is typical for these videos. In d, &D the Naga have been around since the uh, Guardian Naga, the Spirit Naga and the Water Naga first appeared in the official newsletter of TSR Games, the Strategic Review number 3, way back in 1975. They were depicted, much as we find them in 5th edition actually, with some minor additions you may want to include as an optional extras for your Naga encounters. Uh, the Guardian Naga are found in sacred places, or guarding the treasure of lawful minions. An interesting distinction, minions. So the treasures and sacred places are those who serve the Naga. They are about, they're about 15 to 20 feet long and can spit poison bite or constrict. In addition, they are able to cast divine magic as though they were a cleric. And you can see in 5th edition, the distinction between the Guardian Naga and the Spirit Naga is mainly about arcane spells or divine spells. Water Naga are the most numerous and widespread in places where there are lakes and ponds. They inhabit only fresh water, usually living in palaces deep beneath the surface of large ponds and lakes. They are smaller, only about 10 feet long, and they also have a poisonous bite. In addition, they are able to use arcane mag magic, but they never bother to and have ab no aptitude for casting fire or lightning spells. The spirit naga are totally evil, have the most human-like heads on their snake bodies, and have a wickedly poisonous bite. They have the ability to charm a victim with their gaze, and in 5th edition this is represented by the ability to cast Dominate Person spell. They are very skilled in magic, able to cast both divine and arcane spells, and are around 15 feet long. So that is how they were originally depicted in the very edition, very early editions of TNT. So they've changed a little bit, but not a hell of a lot. Naga were created by the reptilian race creator race called the Saruk, who were the first species to raise an empire on the land after the ice retreated from the end of the Shadow Epoch, 35,000 years before the beginning of the Dale Reckoning calendar. The Saruk Empire of Okoth was founded on the supercontinent of Milroro Boros along the warm forested shores of the Azalduth, which was then the largest freshwater lake in Faerun. Within a hundred years, most of Faerun was theirs, and they began to seed new empires in different lands, such as uh, Mare Shulk uh, on the Cholton Peninsula, where Nagas, Bainala, Yoanti, Terrafolk, Trog and Troglodytes were created, along with numerous other scaly kind which have since become extinct, as far as we know. The Saruk civilization achieved tremendous deeds and great feats of magic, but in an effort to drown the Faerun, their ancient enemies, I've got another uh, video on the Faerun, I'll put a link uh, on a tag for this one, under the flooding waters of a redirected sea, they caused massive ecological change and doomed them to a final decline and allowed the amphibian Batrachi to become the next great empire after them. Of course, the Yuanti rose in the, the bones uh, of the center of the, the Saruk Empire. The Mashulkian Naga spread across the world of Toril and has always, always remained numerous on Faerun, as the majority of them are immortal. Those who are um, in the habit of recording their deeds and the events of their incredibly long history they have observed don't bother with scrolls, tomes, or even imprints on metal, all of which will decay over time. Much like dwarves, they, they have no time for that sort of um, decrepit record keeping. The Naga magically imprint their knowledge into lore gems, which the uh, the elves have picked up the skill of. I think I'll make a video about the Saruk soon, as they're not mentioned in 5th edition Monster Manual at all. In fact, the orig origin of the Naga is said to be a humanoid race long lost to history. True, they're mostly lost to history, yes, but the Saruk were not humanoids. Most skilled sages of Toril would have no idea about them, though, really. It was a very, very long time ago. However, the Saruk are not extinct. They're just extremely rare on Toril, with a few entombed in magical stasis chambers, with the rest scattered throughout the multiverse. Toril's only a distant memory. Before I talk about the specific traits of the Naga breed, some details on their deity. Shekinesta is the threefold deity of the Nagas. She can appear as the aspect of spirit Nagas, water Nagas and guardian Nagas. She's a complex being, incorporating different aspects, each with a different symbol. 
As the weaver, she is the active, destructive principle of the cosmos. Not entropy exactly, more like the idea that destruction is a precursor to creation and the inevitable end of things before all is recreated as something new. The symbol of this aspect is a mask, and she manifests as a chaotic, evil, old crone spirit naga who has vast knowledge of what has come before, and she's also the aspect of their divine, uh, the divination yeah, for the naga, which the, the, the naga are very good at divination. As the preserver, she manifests as a mature but lovely guardian na- mother naga, um, lawful good in alignment. Um, preserver maintains but does not create all existence. She's the keeper of the flame of the court of light, her divine realm. She's also a guardian of the spirits of the naga dead before they reform into their new body or back into their body, gifting them with sustenance symbolized as water, fruit and bread. And a holy, sim- holy symbol is a jar or a bowl of of grain. As the Empowerer, she is neutral in alignment and appears as a young water naga maiden who may be either hauntingly beautiful or hideously ugly with pitted skin and greasy hair. In her beautiful form, she grants safe passage, while in her ugly form, she draws the uninitiated into opportunities for growth by making everything really difficult. So, a bit like Ganesh in that regard. The Empowerer is the bestower of wisdom and the guardian of the uninitiated and the young. She can be kind and merciful, but she may also force the unwilling into harsh initiations and painful knowledge gained through rough experience. Her holy symbol is the mirror, which represents self-reflection and also the folly of arrogance or vanity. Shikanesta calls the Court of Light her realm, and it may be located in the Outlands, or a layer of the Abyss, I'm not ent- entirely sure. It could actually be mobile throughout the, um, the plains. Divided into three parts, the Court is sought out by those planeswalkers who wish to purify their souls and test their character. The realm is split into three different sections, symbolizing the three different natures of the Naga Queen, obviously. Outermost is the loom of the weaver, a maze of tangled thorny vegetation. Then there's the Hall of Tests, which is the Empowerer's Palace. And with the pal- within the palace, after you get through all those difficult tasks to get there, is the Arcing Flame, a uh, spirit-cleansing fire per- uh, guarded by the Preserver. Of course, the place is teeming with all kinds of serpent folk, including Naga, who are, uh, well, they're not very um, keen to see anybody who's not a scaly kind. The ancient gods of the very early world were generally represented by world serpents, and this includes Shekinesta, Io, Meshulk, Yormungandr, and Jazerian, among others. Some took other forms um, in, consequent, in subsequent years, and the ancient Sarak also had the ability to shapeshift, or limited shapeshifting abilities, I should add. Um, again, I really got to make a video about them. Naga are pretty low key in their worship. They tend to spend the majority of their time in reverie, gazing into crystal balls, mystic pools, bubbling cauldrons, flickering fires or magic mirrors, keeping tabs on the world events that they take an interest in, ensuring nobody comes sneaking up on them uninvited. Before the elves learned the ability to create Kira, the lesser lore gems, the Naga were making and wearing them to enhance their informational memory. With so many thousands of years of knowledge, they tend to forget more than most elves will ever know. Naga may actually store memories inside of the special gems, tirelessly, uh, timelessly preserving them in what, to an adventurer, may just look like a stash of precious jewels mounted in diadems and amulets. Of course, a wizard would probably recognize these as, um, well, quite quickly um, for what they are and be just as keen than the, as the original Naga owner to take possession of them. The magical knowledge, historical accounts and other information that these artifacts hold is incredibly valuable. In the 5th edition Monster Manual, we have a listing for the Guardian Naga and the Spirit Naga, as well as the Bone Naga, but no Water Naga, which is odd, since they're actually more common. Naga all share certain traits. The primary one is that they don't generally fear death, because they are immortal. Second, they're very capable spellcasters, and this is really their main defensive and offensive weapon, along with their familiarity and preparedness of their chosen environment, their lair. They usually have a poison attack. The Spirit Naga has an injectable venom. The Guardian um, has a venom that it spits. They also concentrate their most formidable attacks, both magical and physical, into the very start of any conflict, seeking to either swiftly end an enemy with overwhelming force or subject it to their superior will. So going into combat with a Naga, you should basically hit them, hit the players with as much firepower as you can possibly bear when they're going into combat with a Naga as soon as combat starts. The Naga do not mess around. They've been alive for a very, very long time and they know how combat works. So they, they try and get their hits in as quickly as possible to, to wipe out a party very quickly. 
The Mishulkian Saruk created Nagas to serve as loyal guardians, researchers into the arcane arts, and agents of exploration. The so, slow decline of the Saruk Empire saw it taken over by the Iwanti from the centre on, outwards, but the Naga had long since expanded far and wide, creating frontier regions that were firmly under their control. Over time, the original Nagas fragmented into the myriad sub-races, each with their own abilities. Now, millennia after the Saruk dispatched their creations to the far corners of Faerun, Nagas can be found almost everywhere, although most dislike the cold climates, so you generally don't find them there. Their naturally potent spellcasters born with an inherent understanding of the art. Regardless of their nature and loyalties, Nagas are crafty, cunning, and charismatic enough to dominate lesser races through their force of personality alone. It just comes naturally to them. Most are naturally curious, obviously, loyal to a fault sometimes, and usually skilled at deduce deductive reasoning because they've just got so much experience. Beyond these basic traits, the attitudes and goals differ by sub-race as well as each individual is quite unique. So you can get spirit nagas that aren't entirely thoroughly evil, and you can get guardian nagas which are not all squeaky clean, and they may have a checkered past. Dark nagas prefer to plot and scheme, forming calculated alliances with other evil creatures so as to gather prey and wealth more efficiently. Uh, nagas are known to feed on orc and human flesh. Um, good and bad. The serenely wise guardian Nagas concern themselves primarily with preserving beauty and goodness. Iridescent Nagas are itinerant wanderers, constantly seeking new discoveries and hidden beauty in the world. Spirit Nagas, on the other hand, see only evil and ugliness, and they seek to harm wherever they can. They're bad-tempered and mischievous. Uh, the Water Nagas tend to lash out if threatened, but otherwise they prefer to withdraw from the world at large, content to languish in their um, castles and palaces under the waves. Of the um, minor Naga races, such as the Bainla, um, they're cruel, mostly cunning, but um, they desire magic and power, so they seek out magical items and things which enhance their personal power. Bone Nagas, of course, are undead creatures consumed with hatred and malice um, for what has been done to them. They detest servitude above all else, and they will kill the living any chance they get. But otherwise, they're akin to Nagas, the, the Nagas that they once were. Ha Nagas are huge. They revel in their own devastating powers, um, seeing all other creatures as lesser beings that would bow down before them. Ha Nagas, I've got a, um, more on them in a moment. And the Naga Hydras, of course, are fearsome predators that haunt the depths of the darkest forests and prey on lesser races. Uh, generally aren't found that often underground. Dark Naga has a deep purple eel-like body covered in fine scales. Its tail ends in a barbed stinger. Um, which is how it inflicts its, most of its poison attacks. Its head resembles an eel's, except it's got a human-like visage. The gun naga looks like a snake with a beautiful human face, or a handsome human face. Its body is covered with green gold scales that exude a sweet floral scent, and a gold frill extends from the top of its head to the tip of its tail. They um, don't have a stinger, either, but they can spit their venom. Iridescent nagas are gentle creatures, that get their name from the fine mirror-like scales that cover their body, radiating a scintillating array of colours whenever it moves. Its head is only vaguely human, and with a frill of silver feathers that runs down its neck to its tail. Cloaked in the cloying stink of carrion, the spirit naga looks as foul as it smells. The black body of a spirit naga is banded in swaths of green, crim uh, bright crimson, and stringy hair hangs limply from its vaguely human head. So... The Spirit Naga in the Monster Manual in 5th edition actually looks quite a bit different from its original depiction. And if you look at the old uh, miniatures of the Dark Nagas, you'll see that they had a very, like, a crone-like evil human head and um, a banded sort of coral snake body, which um, I prefer, actually. Um, the Water Naga is covered with emerald green scales and reticulated patterns that run the length of its body. Fiery red and orange spines jut out along its spine from the base of its vaguely human head to the tip of its tail. The Ha Naga is a massive and powerful Naga Lord, which is colossal in size, often worshipped by spirit Nagas as a god. A Ha Naga takes the same general shape, form as the spirit Naga, although it is of immense size and power, growing as long as a hundred feet or more. The Ha Naga has no set colour, but instead adapts and the hues and shades of its scales to match its environment, much like a chameleon. The head of a Ha Naga is that of a classically beautiful human woman or handsome man, and Ha Nagas prefer to make their lairs in the ruins of ancient civilizations that they've brought down themselves, typically. Um, 
which they celebrate by by hanging out in the centers of power, what once were the power of those previous races. Their favorite locale to nest is a temple or a throne room or maybe a coliseum. It's in this place that the Hanaga gathers together the treasures of the society, bringing art, fine jewelry, and the recorded history of the civilization together as a tribute to its own devastating prowess. They have the ability to fly at will as a magical trait, as per the spell, and they also have advantage on stealth attacks due to their chameleon scales, as well as all of their usual powers and abilities of a spirit naga, and of course, their huge size. The Bainla are evil naga-like creatures found in the land and the water throughout the warmer regions of the Forgotten Realms, named for the many alliances between individuals of their race and the priests of Bain. Bainlar are native to the realms on the prime material plane. They're also quite independent in nature and not, they generally don't serve or obey other servants of Bane, but they work with them. They've got long, dark, snake-like bodies and large, quite large human-like heads, so larger than your normal naga head, um, leering and kind of evil-eyed. They're dark purple-green in color, each with green, white, glistening eyes and a brownish um tail that sort of it tapers towards a brownish color near the end and they've got tiny tentacles that grow in a ring around its mouth um, they're too weak to wield weapons but they can wear manipulate or carry minor items such as rings keys wands and bits of food they can breathe air and water uh, without any harm or hesitation so they they're quite adaptable and um, can spread to many different environments they average around 22 to 25 feet long they're formidable combatants able to cast a spell use a carried weapon or a worn magic item plus they all can, can also make a bite in a stinger attack both of which have poison that causes additional damage and unconsciousness for 1d4 plus round uh, plus one rounds during which time the victim's skin will turn blue. Now, I don't know if that's a common trait of other Naga, whether their poison can make you go unconscious and also turn you blue, but um, I think that's a pretty cool, quirky trait. They are selfish, solitary, but often cooperate with other creatures for mutual gain, particularly if it means teaming up to kill some shared threat. They speak common and orcish and horrid hissing voices, and they're paranoid, treacherous, and greedily acquire magic items that they can use to compensate for their own weaknesses. They will adhere to the letter, if not the intent of any agreement, and think nothing of commanding their underlings to violate those contracts in order to get what they want. So they won't violate the agreement, but they they see no problem with their minions doing so. Bainla have been known to steal and uh, tend to entire herds of livestock for their own larders, and can dine with perfect safety on snakes and other creatures that generate poisons and acids um, to which they're immune. Bainla can, are also highly resistant to petrification, um, as are uh, most Naga. Like all Naga, they are hermaphrodites and each gives birth to a single young once per winter. The Bainla parent hunts with its um, hungry offspring and teaches them spells. This is fairly typical of all Naga. They teach them spells and, um, until they grow up to, and then they basically just leave them where they are and the adult Naga will then go off and find another lair somewhere else because they're naturally kind of inquisitive explorers anyway. They uh, mate whenever they encounter another Bainla or Naga encounters another Naga. Um, so they basically exchange material and um, they typically avoid fighting members of their own kind, even other subreads. Beyond this, unless weakened or frightened, it avoids consorting with its fellows. And so they don't ask for help unless they're really desperate. And yeah. They tend to um, raise their, their young in uh, places that are either a lair that they've established themselves or a place which is suitable for the youngster to create a lair for itself in relative safety. So when the parent sneaks away and leaves its young, it can uh, return to its favorite areas of its own with little fear of its, of its youngster coming after them um, because they're quite independent and solitary and they don't like being visited by their kids. They will either know the spells of a sixth level cleric of Bane or the arcane magic, magic of a sixth level wizard. So they can be either more like a spirit naga or a guardian naga but with no attribute bonus to their spell casting. Nagas are inherently curious about the world in general and magic in particular. This applies to basically all of them. They hold the pursuit of knowledge and understanding above all other goals and the art above all other forms of study. While they can see the strategic advantages of consulting a large library of wizard spells or entreating a deity for divine support, most Nagas see the art as an extension of their mortal form. Thus, they tend to view sorcery as a, the perfect embodiment of natural magic. 
And most Nagas form uh, the view that the preservation of cultural achievements is a worthy goal, regardless of the race that develop, develop them. So they tend to tend after the information of races which have passed. So they'll seek out lost netheral um, cities and libraries and things. They'll seek out war-forged factories and gather the knowledge of runic magic from hidden dwarven enclaves and things like that. So they'll t- typically break into places which have been sealed off from the, from the view of other races, um, such as elven enclaves from the, from the time of the Crown Wars and things like that. So Nagas tend to break into places and establish lairs um, which have been sort of forgotten and left behind by other races for good reasons. Thus, Nagas of all sub-races seek out, willingly seek out lost and um, forbidden knowledge and guard the remains of fallen civilizations. Even Har Nagas and Spirit Nagas, which normally revel in destruction, like to lair amidst the ruins of lost cities or even the remains of temples, castles or other edifices that they themselves have destroyed, typically, ironically. Most Nagas see their limbless physical form as a philosophical ideal for a true explorer or scholar. They're not burdened um, <laughs> with reliance on their physical forms. They, they pursue, pursuit of knowledge and magical enhancement is kind of inherent in them. They view the use of physical limbs to manipulate the environment as symptomatic of a lesser mind that has been diverted from true understanding of the universe. According to some Naga philosophies, lesser races constitute the limbs of a metaphysical body in which the Naga is the brain. Thus, the pairing of Nagas with lesser servitors constitutes a perfect melding of mind and body. Each Naga calls member of its own race Naja Sara, a nuanced term loosely translated as embodiments of the ideal. They call members of lesser um, other Naga sub-races Naja Sisna, shadows of the ideal, and young Nagas are of any kind are known as Nagara. Although the term has acquired a secondary meaning that encompasses the ruling dark Naga caste of Najara, um, bone Nagas and rarer undead Nagas are called Naja Sisna, eternal shadows of the ideal. Nagas never speak in the first person singular, preferring instead the royal we. An individual Naga of any kind will refer to itself as Sisnaja, we the ideal. Members of lesser races are termed Distasara, hands of the embodiment, while more powerful creatures are called Sinthisasa, teachers worthy of emulating. Sinthisasa. Nagas are natural spellcasters, and the breadth and depth of their experimentation with the art rivals that of any other race. Because their ancestors helped the Saruk establish the foundations of magic, uh, modern-day Nagas have a deep understanding of the history of the art and the context in which magic advances has been made. Because of this natural affinity for research, they, um, they basically just they have an inherent understanding of spells. So they can probably um, have a better chance of inventing a spell on the fly for a specific task um, than other spellcasters would, um, what would normally result in chaos. Although Nagas experiment with and employ all types of spells, they're masters of divination and guile, so they tend to favour that, and the schools of divination and enchantment and illusion. Many Nagas are skilled in the art of creating magical items. Um, They typically favour objects that they can employ in their natural form, so items worn over the eyes, such as lenses, goggles and masks, on the head, such as coronets, diadems, crowns, hats, headbands, helms, um, phylacteries, or around the neck, such as amulets, brooches, medallions, necklaces, periaps, and um, scarabs are common. So they, yeah, it's not uncommon to see an, uh, a naga which is bedecked in rel- relatively fancy finery. It's a pretty snake. If you want to create any of the breeds of naga for your games, use the stats for the spirit naga as a base. Give them whatever spells you feel appropriate for the sort of fight you have planned, and give them the ability to constrict as per the Constrictor Snake in the back of the Monster Manual, page 320, but increase the two-hit damage and escape DC appropriately. Also, most Naga have a poison attack, including the Bone Naga, which doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about it, but oh well. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, feel free to do so, and be sure to hit the notification bell as I upload from the other side of the world sometime in your future for access to all the scripts and one week advanced access to these videos. Consider becoming a patron of the channel on Patreon. And a special thanks to all of the patrons which have joined me just recently. Oh man, you're my people. For a minimum of just $1 per month, join the community on our Discord server. Come say hi. I'll try and check in there at least once a week. Also, if you want to pick up on a new video game 
at a significant daily discount and help me out in the process, check out the daily deal on Chrono in the link down below, as well as um, there's a link to some merch as well, and also a link to the wonderful people over at Music for Meditation who are uh, producing music for my Demon series at the moment, and hopefully that, that relationship will expand somewhat. We'll see. As always, thanks for listening. I'll be back for more with more for you very soon.